Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is David Epstein. He's the author of the New York Times bestsellers range and the sports gene. David, welcome to World of DAS. Thanks so much for having me, Warren. Now, uh, I love the book range, um, and you you kind of make the case there for generalists over specialists and kind of argue that having too narrow of a focus in your career or specializing early can can actually be a disadvantage in the long run. And you 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 start with this analogy of Roger Federer versus uh, Tiger Woods um, and walk walk me through the Roger Federer side of it. Yeah, so so Roger Federer, when he was a kid, played a whole bunch of different sports. Um, his mom was actually a tennis coach, but declined to coach him because he wouldn't return balls normally. Um, you know, he played handball, rugby, basketball, volleyball, uh, skateboarding, swimming. I assume um, soccer, since he grew soccer, up there. Yeah, that's right, yeah, basketball. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm skiing. I'm sure I'm like missing one or two. Wrestling, uh, and he. So he was doing this diversity of things. He declined to move up to a higher level when his coaches wanted him to, because he just wanted to talk about pro wrestling with his friends after practice. And he was not from an early age sort of focused on being the next great. In fact, when a funny story, when a reporter asked him when he started getting good, what he would, if he ever became a pro, what he would buy with his first hypothetical paycheck, he said a Mercedes and his mother, you know, didn't want him putting all his eggs in that basket was appalled and asked the reporter if she could listen to the recording. It turned out Roger said, mere CDs in Swiss German. He just wanted more CDs, not a Mercedes. <laughs> he was fine with that. And so he ended up you know, participating in multiple sports and more um, lightly structured or unstructured tennis you know, until years after uh, some of his, his peers were, were doing much more sort of focused, deliberate practice and, and only tennis. And what, I mean, it does seem counterintuitive for people who've grown up like with the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour rule of the importance of practice. And, um, and uh, you know, a lot of us, we see these like super uh, successful people who, who really gave up on that optionality early and went all in on a particular, uh, particular thing. Um, wh- where do you, where do you see the, 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 this this kind of dissidence between like what we see and maybe what is actual in practice. Yeah, I think that's there's a couple important things you get at there. One of which, just to mention with Gladwell, he and I the last time we we became running buddies, like you know, arguing about this stuff on our own time. And there's a video of us at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference where we sort of come to this. Okay, I think I I conflated the fact that a lot of practice is necessary to become great which he agrees with and I agree with, uh, with the idea that that means you should just pick something as early as possible and stick, which he now thinks is false. So I think we actually are very much like in agreement um, at this point now. Um, But I think think you make really interesting points about optionality. And I think that's like important. I think we need specialists and generalists, by the way. But um, I think the, the danger is in giving up basically like in premature optimization is like, how do you go about giving up that, that optionality? Cause, Cause a lot of what you're talking about is like, maybe don't specialize when you're 10 years old, but obviously at some point Federer did specialize Absolutely. in playing tennis. Yeah. I mean, basically everyone to one degree or another specializes it at some point. And so I think to me, like the less marketable, but, but maybe more true subtitle of what my book could have been was like, sometimes the things you do that will give you a short-term head start can actually undermine your long-term development. Whether that has to do with literally how you learn a skill, how you pick what you're, you're going to focus in on. And so when I think about this trade-off, I think about this, this research at Harvard called the Dark Horse Project I wrote about that was studying how do people find work with high match quality, meaning that, that fits their abilities and interests very well. And some of those people, a lot of those people were also very financially successful, but the dependent variable was, was fulfillment. Um, and basically what those people do is they will pick a path. They will, and, and they'll say like, here's who I am right now. Here are my abilities and interests. I'm going to do this, but they're willing to say maybe a year from now I'll change because I will have learned something about myself or my opportunities will have changed. And sometimes early on, they find something that fits really well and they can stick. That did happen in the study, but the large majority was people who did that a number of times and sort of made these, these opportunistic pivots. So I think it's 
it's fine to have a long-term goal as long as you don't shut yourself off from making opportunistic pivots since like we're not so good at predicting exactly who we or the world will be. Well, one of the things you talk about is just experts and the idea of expertise and the, um, you know, there's all these studies, the Tetlock study, these other studies where the experts don't do better than just the average smart person. In fact, in many cases, the experts do worse than the average smart person. First of all, like that's very counterintuitive. Yeah. Like, why is that? And then is that, is there like, did they once do better like a hundred years ago, but now the experts are on decline because they're too specialized or so, or how do you think that is like changing over time? That's interesting. I don't totally know the answer to that because this research was a 20 year project. And before that, I don't think there was anything even remotely approaching this rigor. So yeah. I think it would be hard to compare um, what happened before that. I think there might be reason to believe though that they're getting worse in this forecasting. So this was this 20 year study of people making predictions of geopolitical, economic, technological trends and all these things. And it, it involved 83,000 different predictions and it needed that because you had to separate luck from skill basically yep. over a really long time period. Um, and, and again, these, the people who turned out to be the worst forecasters, as you alluded to, were like the people who had spent their entire careers kind of studying one or two problems and came to see the whole world through like one lens or mental model. That didn't mean these people were useless necessarily. Like sometimes they, they dug up important information, but when it came to forecasting, they would like bend everything around this this very narrow worldview. And th so they would become like more confident and less accurate <laughs> with experience, which was a really bad combination. I, mean, I guess it's a bad combination for us, good combination for them, because it turned out there was an inverse relationship between fame and accuracy in yeah. the study. So like the people you see prognosticating on the news are probably like some of them literally scientifically proven to be the worst forecasters in the world, which is kind of funny. Well, sometimes being interesting doesn't mean you're more likely to be correct. And I think from reading this study, actually, that, that it suggests that some of those really narrow, you know, what Tetlock refers to as hedgehogs, um, they actually are really good at sounding like very authoritative quickly on TV because they always bend everything to a certain set of facts. And so it's, there's not a lot of like, on the one hand, on the other hand, they're not the, the best forecasters in this work were, uh, Tetlock described them as having dragonfly eyes. So dragonfly's eyes are made of thousands of different lenses, each one of which takes a different picture. And then they're synthesized in the dragonfly's brain. And so these people would go in their professional and personal networks and like collect, collect, collect perspectives and treat their own ideas as sort of hypotheses and, and look to falsify them. Whereas the hedgehogs were more like, I know it, like, here's all the facts I know about this thing. And they're just totally authoritative. So I think it makes for entertaining listening, um, but not accurate prediction, which is troubling. And, and, and I mean, you could see this even in public life where maybe somebody who's a health expert wasn't the best at creating like the COVID policy uh, because they looked at it from a very like health related lens. You know, interestingly, some of the people in Tetlock's work became such good forecasters that they spun it off as its own business. And they were written up in Time Magazine. If you look up eerily accurate predictions in Time Magazine, because they were making so much more accurate predictions about COVID than the people who were officially tasked with making these predictions. And I think what you allude to, there was a little research about this at, at MIT during the pandemic, that, that a lot of the people tasked with making official predictions were looking at things like so narrowly through like the lens of their discipline when obviously this was something that affected the economy and society and public health. And there were all these factors that should have been considered, right? And so when predictions were made with like, as if there was only one dependent variable that you were concerned with, um, it didn't go that well. And, and by the way, some of those, again, thinking back to Tetlock's work, <laughs> one of the most alarming things to me was the really, really narrow hedgehog forecasters were often like, not to, I, I bet, I think there's like probably a lot of, having listened to this podcast, I think there's like a lot of stat heads that listen to it. So I'm okay, like talking like this, which is yeah. that like, they they were like anti-Bayesian. So they would, they would make a prediction, then things would go wrong. And instead of saying, oh, I had a misunderstanding, I'm going to adjust, you know, my priors were wrong. I'm going to adjust in the direction that I went wrong. They will adjust in the wrong direction. 
saying like, oh, I nailed this. If only one thing would have gone a little bit different. Ah, uh, okay, got it. this point where they actually- so Like a justification. In the direction. Yeah. Yeah, which is, which is nuts. And I've seen this from some very, if you follow like certain columnists who make like a lot of economic predictions, you actually see this quite regularly where they'll say like, you know, uh, like they'll, they'll like justify retrospectively um, predictions they made by saying like, if just this one thing had gone different or I couldn't have known those people would be so stupid, right? Like they, they justify their- Or when they say like ways. the economists have predicted nine out of the last four recessions or something like that. <laughs> That's, I mean, business prediction on, on TV like drives me nuts because you'll see, you know, whatever you watch like, some CNN money channel or something. It's like, next up, we're going to have the person who correctly predicted something in the past. And you're like 10 million people made a prediction about that phenomenon. <laughs> like one person, there's a, a British uh, magician named Darren Brown, who, who like did a great program. I think you can find it on YouTube showing like why that's so silly, where he, he basically shows that he sends correct horse racing predictions to this, this one woman over and over again. And uh -huh. she, you know, makes like 10 predictions in a row. And then they reveal later that he was sending predictions to like a million people and just yeah. like whittling it down to like who was getting the right ones, which is basically what I think is happening on the like business news a lot. Uh, how do you think, like, even if you think, let's say the U S Supreme court, okay, well, we've got, you know, nine people, eight of them are former judges, all nine are constitutional scholars. Like, could we actually have a better court? You think if like some of them were non-lawyers or some of them were, you know, politicians or, you know, other things before they became uh, Supreme Court uh, justices? I mean, I think it's good for them, obviously, to have like deep, deep knowledge of the law. At the same time, I think it would not be bad for them uh, to be broader. I mean, I think in one of the areas I was talking to a federal judge about this recently, that judges now have to make so many decisions that involve science. And if yeah. they don't, aren't like science curious, again, in I mentioned in range, this research that showed that not science knowledge, but science curiosity really was one of the predictors of, of people who would sort of make good decisions uh, and, and come to true conclusions in science. And so I think so many of their decisions intersect with that, that if they're not interested in it, then that's a real problem because they're sort of not going to understand some of their, their decision-making. But I mean, the way the Supreme court works, of course, is like, it's a little bit to me, like w when I see on the news and they're like, you know, trawling all of Twitter for who makes like the most craziest comment. It's like, you know, we do have a system that's picking people because their judgments are presumably like very predictable along party lines. And I'm not sure that's probably not what you would do if you were running a business and trying to like get together a group of executives who would, be good decision makers, I wouldn't think. Um, I mean, the team of rivals aspect of it is maybe good, yeah. but um, you know, I think there can be be a price to pay for some of that. What do you think? Well, do you have a sense of uh, one thing that I'm always interested about the Supreme Court is while like people have a strong ideology and, and many of them are, you, you might call them hedgehogs, they, they all seem to get along super well. Um, you have these nine people, very, very different people, and they respect each other deeply. And they, um, you know, even people from very, very opposite ideologies are very, very close friends, and they go to each other's houses. And they, uh, and you, you just don't see that as much in public life, except on the Supreme Court. That's right. That's a good point. And I wonder if that's, you know, they're obviously like, they think a lot like these are these are thoughtful people and they yeah. have to they have to work together and and they end up making a lot of decisions together right and some go your way and some don't and i wonder if that's sort of a good um you know sort of a good crucible for realizing that like some decisions are going to go your way and some aren't and and by the way i also think having met like a bunch of clerks for federal judges i think they are able to sort of expand their brains in some ways by having these like really interesting rosters of clerks that come from from different places different persuasions so i think they get a lot of help and their their clerks are really really influential and can kind of diversify their view but i but i do think it'd be good you know i think there's a reason why like nobel laureate uh scientists are about 22 times more likely to have a hobby unrelated to their work as are as are their peer scientists it's like these this this broad interests are sort of what some researchers call network of enterprise can kind of broaden their decision-making lens, which has been shown in some, some research, really interesting paper on this by a guy named Rick Larrick, that broadening the decision-making lens helps you avoid to some degree, some of the typical cognitive biases in decision-making like availability bias, where 
you, you base your judgments on like the first dramatic example of something that jumps to mind, which turns out to be like a really bad way to make decisions. Interesting. Ty- Tyler Cowen has this observation that he thinks generalists are actually the most specialized people because they can kind of do anything. Um, 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 and because they can't do anything except they can make observations, right? So they're, they're actually good at making these observations. Um, and there's, he, he also thinks there's a difference between a generalist and let's say a polymath or say, yeah. have you thought about that? Yeah. I mean, and that's interesting about Tyler. Cause he, he, he shows up in things I think related to this conversation a bunch of times. Like he wrote this article about how the, like the, the job that most people will have in the future is marketing, which is like, I think a pretty, I don't, I don't know that he thinks that's a good thing, but that's what he, <laughs> he predicts, which is like a pretty general, you know, communications job. Um, and he's also, by the way, been in, in response to some work done by Steve Levitt said like, I think, I think this, maybe this was in the CNN article where he said, if you're thinking about quitting your job, you should, like, it's probably too late. So he's yeah. like an, an advocate of pivoting, I think, but that that distinction between generalist and polymath, um, it's semantic to some degree, right? Like I'll be the first person to say, like in range, do I know exactly what a generalist is? N- no. And in fact, it's it's operationalized differently in different areas of research. So in some areas of research, it can be sort of pinned down in a way. Like when I was writing about some of the the patenting research, there generalists, specialists, and polymaths are sometimes characterized by the number of different tech classes that they have done work in as classified by the patent office. So, you know, whereas in like research in comic books, it's classified by the number of different genres someone has worked in. So it's operationalized in all these different ways, depending on the area of research. But I think sort of intuitively, the the generalist is someone who has, has gone broad, but not particularly deep, where a polymath is someone who has this wide array of interests, but will kind of dive deep and come up and dive deep again and come up and dive deep again. And ultimately, you know, and I would say like a person like Tyler, I think kind of fits this mold of being polymathic, where it dive deep, dive deep, and then kind of connects these things in ways um, that that is kind of unusual and becomes this, this very interesting advantage because it's someone who you can take a lot of ideas to, and they'll be able to like add something to the conversation because they've connected so many different areas in their brain. So I sort of view him as someone like that. One of the things interesting about Tyler Cowen is that he, um, you know, he, he sets his priority almost by his inbox um, about like, so he, he often says like his, his reading email is his business model. You know, he gets an email and then that kind of like <laughs> gets funny. him on some sort of path and he kind of, which is almost the opposite of every advice, you know, that you, yeah. would, that you would give, <laughs> give somebody, uh, you know, and when we think about generalists, like we've got like, you know, the historical ones, let's say Leonardo da Vinci, Ben Franklin, um, it, it, in this modern economy, it does seem like it's more difficult to be a truly great generalist. Like, do you look at certain people in the mo- in today's world and, and point to them as, okay, these guys, I'm putting them on a pedestal. Yeah, personally. Yeah. So let me, I, I do think it is harder and maybe not even desirable to be like a Da Vinci style um, generalist at this point, but, but yeah, there are people I think about all the time that, that I sort of admire in this way, not to say that I don't also admire some, some very narrow specialists, but like, um, you know, Zainab Tufeki, who uh, I think is just like a brilliant writer. I have no idea how she turns out so much great content. I'm not even sure what her act. I think she studied computer science, but her PhD may be in like sociology of technology, but she wrote brilliantly early in the pandemic about things that like people were getting wrong and just seems to be like from her like reviews of like the sociology of Game of Thrones to her like pandemic predictions. It's just <laughs> amazing. You know, so her, um, you know, in, in sort of the, the sports world, there's a woman named Haley, Haley Wickenheiser. I love who she was actually just last week, I think promoted to become the first assistant general manager uh, in the NHL. She's assistant GM for the Toronto Maple Leafs. She's also recently became a general medicine doctor and she's a four-time Olympic gold medalist in hockey and an Olympian in softball. Oh my gosh. Um, and now the first, <laughs> and she's not even like very old, but some of the other people like Andre Geim, a scientist I write about in the book, who again is in the scheme of humanity is quite specialized, right? He's a physicist, but he inspired the name of my, my son, Andre. He, he likes to say, he sort of changes his area of work kind of every five years, as he likes to say, I don't do research, I only do search. 
Uh -huh. um, and he's, he's the only scientist who's won both the Nobel prize and the Ig Nobel prize for like the year's silliest work. Cause he's always trying sort of unexpected stuff. Um, in film, Christopher Nolan, who says like between projects, I just have to read with like no apparent goal until like stuff kind of comes to me. One of my favorite novelists, Jhumpa Lahiri, who was like one of the writers of a generation and gave up writing in English to go and try to learn and write in Italian just to kind of like diversify her view on things. Wow. Um, okay. I don't know if you want me to keep throwing these people out. Like in, in the business world, a guy named Dan Siegel, I think is really interesting. Like he started Student Advantage, which was sort of like the AARP yeah. for college students. And then he, he started this um, platform for sourcing green building materials. And then he ran um, a healthcare business that helped monitor patients' uh, nervous systems during surgery. And now he's running a company that helps match doctors to needs in rural hospitals. So I don't know. I mean, obviously I have a long running list of these sorts of things because I'm interested in it. If you think of like the specialist versus the generalist, the, the, the specialist in today's world is also has a, a new competition with AI. Yeah. How do you think AI will change the way we think about these specialists? Yeah, there are, there are, and the, the model I think that I talk about a little bit in the book is like the hybrid chess, right? Where writing about how, when Gary Kasparov was beat yeah. by deep blue, you know, now he'd be beat by like a free app on your phone. He noticed that computers played chess in a, in an odd way where they were so much better at tactics, the, like the patterns that you have to memorize, um, which is why you, you actually do need to start studying chess patterns by age 12 or your chance of reaching international master status drops precipitously. Um, but it's, it's a domain that's, you know, based on repetitive patterns, which is why it's so easy to automate. And so Kasparov then promoted these freestyle chess tournaments where humans and computers could play in any combination. And the winners weren't grandmasters or supercomputers or grandmasters with supercomputers. It was like two amateur chess players with three normal laptops. And they knew like something about chess and something about algorithmic search and could kind of coach the computers. And I think that's emblematic of the fact that when you take away the sort of repetitive pattern part of the task that people like Kasparov had to spend decades learning, yeah, you, you sort of shift the skills that are needed to these much more strategic ones where I think humans still have a lot to add. And so I think when you look at certain things like, um, you know, so I think areas that are really amenable to this like very early specialization of kind of repetitive uh, practice, those are the ones that are most easily. Yeah, in some ways you can think of like foreign policy too, because you know, you just you spend years and years becoming an expert on Kazakhstan or something like that, and um, and nowadays like you can you get access to information so much quicker you can get you know you can there's wikipedia there's all these other things for you to to learn through whereas before you had to suspend like all this time in a library and you even had you had to go there many times now you can be as sometimes more of an expert without even going in fact the people who didn't go there often are better at predicting it sometimes than the people who have been there i mean to look at the super forecasting research small teams of super forecasters you know teams of a dozen of the people in that research uh, outperformed like groups of intelligence analysts by about 30% using these things called Briar scores that, and those, the intelligence analysts had access to classified information. Right. And, and many of them might were probably had spent time on the ground in these yeah, cases. Yeah. yeah. And did not. But I mean, I think this, this issue of specialists getting like replaced by AI, I think like radiology is an interesting place to think about because that's a place where you know, AI and machine learning has moved in quite a bit because so much of it is about recognizing sort of repetitive things. In yeah, images. even in radiology, there hasn't been one radiologist that's been replaced. Yeah, and, and I don't think they, and, and I think there's some argument that some of them maybe could be because I do think there's some evidence that AI has helped, you know, decrease false positives and false negatives. But I think it's been best when it's been like a centaur where it's partnered with those radiologists. And even if what the radiologists do now is replaced, I think they will move to that more strategic level where, I mean, part of the issue with lots of medical screening is you pick stuff up, but was it good that you picked it up? Do yeah. you want to treat it? How do you balance the outcomes you're thinking about? So I do think over time, those specialists will move to a more sort of strategic role and less of the, the repetitive, like a great model of this, I think that I didn't write about, but I was looking back at coverage from the early 1970s when ATMs first came online in the US and it's super apocalyptic, like 
300, I think there were like 300,000 bank tellers or something at the time. They're all going to go out of business overnight. And in fact, what happened over the next 50 years, maybe that'll happen at some point, but over the next 50 years, as there were more ATMs, there were more bank tellers because they made each fewer tellers per branch, but it made each branch cheaper to operate. So more tellers overall, but it fundamentally changed the job of one from someone who was doing this like repetitive cash transaction kind of stuff to someone who's like a marketing professional and a customer service rep or financial yeah. advisor, this much more like strategic, like you outsource the repetitive thing. It doesn't get rid of the need, but it, it moves people to be like on a more strategic level of thinking. And when, when you think of like startups, which is my world, when we're, when you're hiring, let's say you're, 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 you're hiring your first like hundred people, you're usually hiring way more generalists than specialists. But then at some point, as you kind of progress and you know where you're going for sure, then you start hiring these people who are just like very, very good at one small thing and maybe don't have the range to do lots of different things. Do you see that like like smaller organizations benefit from generalists more than larger ones? Or do you think the larger ones also can benefit as well? I think there's definitely, and I'm speculating or extrapolating a little bit from some of the, the kind of team's research here, but I think there's definitely some truth to what you said where I think what you're getting at is there's this huge literature on the so-called explore exploit conundrum um, in businesses where explore is like, looking for new things or figuring out your way through trying to make something new or solving a new problem that requires some fumbling. And then once you've like nailed it down and this is exactly what you, we should do, then you move into this exploit mode. If you're in a scale mode, right? Yeah. And I think, I think there's definitely um, suggestive evidence that once you're going into exploit mode, it, it like you can silo people a lot more without those, some of the negative effects once you're in exploit mode. I don't think that means you don't, need these sort of the, what Freeman Dyson would call the birds, the integrators who are looking at the, the frogs who are down deep in the mud and kind of integrating their knowledge and making sure that someone has sort of a view of the parts. I think that's one of the reasons probably why in this LinkedIn analysis of a half million members, they found that like the best predictor of who would become a future executive was the number of different job functions someone had worked across in an industry okay, because they're like integrating and I would argue that LinkedIn's product actually militates against people wanting to do that, but it still shows up in their results. But um, so I think you still need those integrators, but I do think once you switch from explore to exploit mode, um, you, you can, there's some benefits to some of that more kind of siloization where some people are just like locked in on a very narrow thing. As long as it doesn't get to the point where they have like no connection of their work to the larger strategy at a certain point. It's when you're when you when you're a small company. It's, if you make the analogy of sports, like you don't really know what sport you're playing yet. So you, nimble, just need, yeah. you need someone who's generally a good athlete. Um, but like once you know you're playing like American football, like you need a punter. And yeah, you need yeah. someone who's just good at punting, and like so you just that that person is incredibly important to have on your team. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then you need the people who understand how they're they are integrated into the, into the larger whole. And, and how do you think like as a society, like you make the case we're kind of overvaluing experts in many ways. Um, is that a phenomena of just like our society that we're doing that? Or why is that happening? And how would, how would society like change to not overvalue experts? Yeah, I think some of this overvaluing is um, uh, asking them to do things that their expertise doesn't equip them for. Um, so like making predictions, yeah. which is, I think, one of the things that we most often turn to experts for, and it's something they're they're poorly equipped to well, do. Well, it's kind of like the cancer doctor is really good at treating your cancer, but often not so good at like making dietary policy for the country or something like that. And, and also even, I think medicine's a great example because medicine, I like to talk about a lot in part because it, it, increasing specialization has been both inevitable and beneficial in medicine. I think it would be crazy to argue anything else. At the same time, it's been a very under-recognized double-edged sword. So like to the point where two Harvard-led studies found that if you are uh, checked into a teaching hospital with certain cardiac conditions on the dates of a national cardiology convention, when the most esteemed interventional cardiologists are away, you're less likely to die because, and these researchers concluded it's because you're less likely to sort of get procedures 
that specialists have gotten so used to doing that they will do it reflexively even when they shouldn't. It's called the Einstellung effect in psychology, where you've solved a problem the same way a bunch of times, and then you'll do it even when it's not appropriate. Oh, I would have thought it'd been the opposite. I would have thought because they were like trying these like crazy new things on you, yeah. and you want just like the rote like thing at the general hospital or something. <laughs> no, they're they're actually these like uh, phrases that some medical researchers have been coining in their literature to describe the compulsion to do a certain like certain reflexes they're giving them like latin names where you like one's called the oculostenotic reflex where you like can't resist doing a certain procedure when you see a certain thing even if the evidence has shown that it's not the right thing to do mm -hmm. and so i think in that case like there's a great paper called putting the patient back together again it's about how healthcare has become like all these really siloed experts often treating the same person and we break the world down into these disciplines in order to make it comprehensible, right? But somebody has to like put the world back together again at the end of the day. Somebody has to put the patient back together again at the end of the day. So I think where we've gone wrong is- And often know, they're, they're, it's like the patient or the patient's spouse is supposed to have that role, exactly. which they may be ill-equipped for. And obviously they're, that's, it's very emotional. It's very tough to make those decisions. There isn't like this like other person who sits on your shoulder, who's going to these meetings with you to help you navigate this, the process. Totally. And I mean, sometimes in some areas, you'll get something like that, where like doulas, for example, in childbirth, who are sort of these generalists who understand like rates of procedures, and they understand things like, if a doctor is present too long during a birth, they're, they're probably going to do unnecessary intervention. So they should actually like leave a woman alone in the room sometimes. <laughs> and those and when you have doulas that like the rate of certain procedures plummets precipitously, just because they're sort of helping figure out that risk balance in terms of like the, the patient and their whole needs and desires and things. So I think the problem is not having the specialists, it's esteeming them at the expense of the generalists and not connecting their work so that somebody is seeing the overall picture of the patient. This is how we end up with people getting treated by multiple doctors whose remedies are in competition with one another because like nobody has a view of the, of the overall picture. And I know you've been critical of personalized medicine. Like, why are you so critical and what studies, you know, what holds up and what doesn't hold up? Yeah. And I should say that some of this came from reading the work of people like um, uh, Mike Joyner at the Mayo Clinic and Nigel Panath, who's like the, the, the big stat head at the Mayo Clinic and Vinay Prasad, a hematologist oncologist, who's been really interesting in the pandemic. And what they've sort of written is, you know, more than 20 years ago, we were promised that in a decade, we would be walking around with like our genome on a computer chip um, in our wallet, and we would get medical care tailored to our genome. And I think there were, sir, optimism was a reason to believe that, I think, but also early on in the genetic revolution, like actually, let me give you sort of a personal example that I think might be illustrative of this. I got into, I was trained to be a scientist in my past life and got off that track and became the science writer at Sports Illustrated specifically because I was a national level runner and I had a training partner who died, dropped dead at the end of a race. And I got really interested in sudden cardiac death in athletes and wanted to write about it. He had a, he had a single gene mutation that causes this disease that's almost always the cause of athletes dropping dead called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM. Okay, so when I start learning about this, I realized in the late 90s, some you know, like three different gene mutations. Mutation is just means a gene variant that less than 2% of the population has. Um, three different mutations were discovered that cause, any one of which causes HCM. And so then there was this sort of like celebratory attitude of we can screen everyone. Like we yeah. don't have to have athletes die ever again. Like, and it's usually teenagers. And then some more were found and then some more. And then by, you know, about 10 years later or so, you had 1400 different mutations, any one of which causes the same disease. And two thirds of those had only been discovered in a single family, so-called private mutations. So suddenly you could have tons of people with the same disease, almost none of them having the same causative mutation. And so- And also you, you probably most of them don't drop dead, right? And most of them don't drop dead. And so a lot of them, yeah, most don't drop dead. Most that have symptoms, it's like a much slower progression where the first symptom isn't dropping dead. And so this is a disease, this is the rare minority of diseases that is caused by one powerful mutation. Most medical issues, like most of the things plaguing us today are, first of all, they have huge environmental components and they may involve millions or billions of spots on the genome. 
So you literally can't have a sample size large enough to detect the small effects of each of these spots on the genome, even if everyone in the world was in, in the study. And so I think there are some sort of uh, kind of intractable issues there when it comes to claiming that we can personalize medicine based on the genome. And the optimism early was because what we were finding early was the low hanging fruit of these single gene caused mutations where there has been some miraculous stuff done for some of these very rare diseases that are caused by single powerful mutations. But that is the small, small minority of what people face in healthcare. In the other areas, uh, there's been like, you know, almost no progress. And I would say the lesson of a decade of genetics has been it's more complicated than we thought, basically. And so even in trying to personalize treatments for certain cancer, there, there was like a big study that tried to match people, the genetic mutations of their tumors to certain treatments. Yeah. And only like 2% even got matched, much less the ones that actually worked for. And then you can treat a certain mutation in one cancer. And for reasons unknown to us, you treat the same mutation in a different cancer and it doesn't work anymore. So there's all kinds of stuff going on in the genome and areas of the genome. Genes are just the parts of the genome that code specifically for proteins. That's the minority of the genome. We used to call everything else junk DNA. Now we realize all that junk actually helps regulate how the genes function. So people with the same genes might have different other areas of their genome that regulate how those genes work. And so it just becomes much, much, much more complicated than we expected. Not to mention that a lot of the biggest health problems we're facing now are, I think, you know, the environmental component is larger. Like sometimes people show this graph. It's like, we're winning the war on cancer. Deaths are coming down since like 1990. But if you put the full graph up, we're not even back to 1930 yet. And, and basically because, you know, if we could, if we could increase exercising 5% or decrease smoking rates, 5%, you'd have a bigger impact on mortality than like all the rest of healthcare, basically. All right. Now what, what's your kind of non-obvious advice to getting people to live longer and healthier, obviously get a little bit more exercise, don't smoke, get some sleep, eat a few vegetables. What are yeah. the non-obvious things that we should be thinking about? Yeah. I mean, the obvious stuff is the best yeah. <laughs> getting, getting more moving around. I would say even if you're not doing the exercise, I would try to have more like weight bearing on your legs during the day. So standing desk or something standing, or, or, or even I'm standing like right now, like I'm, I'm, I'm on like a leaning stool where I have like weight on my legs, but I'm sort of like, it's propped along. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And because there's this research showing that when you stop weight bearing on your legs at all, this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that like sweeps blood, uh, fat out of your bloodstream basically goes to sleep. And you don't want that for a long period of time. Like it's almost like as, you know, bad as smoking. <laughs> um, but oh wow. I think okay. as a, a non-obvious. So like, like don't be sitting more than a few hours at a time type of thing or? Yeah, I mean, at least try to try to get up, you know, and, and get some weight bearing on your legs. And I think in, from a non-obvious standpoint, I mean, I think those are somewhat obvious. I would say um, you had to, if you had to pick between um, <laughs> having a good diet or exercising, I would go with, with exercising and bad diet. If you had to pick, you don't have to pick. Yeah, but exercising will like inoculate you from some of the uh, bad things of a of a bad okay, diet. So just like chocolate cake diet, but make sure you're exercising a lot. Type I mean, of thing. don't. But if you had to pick one, <laughs> yes, you know, or if you had to start somewhere. But I would say also movement diversity. There's a, a guy who's great on this called Kelly Starrett, who maybe some people have read. Um, being a becoming a supple leopard, his his book, and I think there is, um, like if you're gonna bend down to get something, go into a squat to get it, like try okay. to add some movement diversity to your life. And I think that's not only good for sort of maintaining some of your skills, but I think there's some suggestive so evidence. Just like you when you're just like walking around, just start dancing and stuff. Oh, dancing, or... dancing. Great. But like, literally when I pick something up now, I go into like a catcher's squat. So I think there's the evidence that one, that's, that's good for you in a number of ways, but also that if you stop like totally stop using certain parts of the range of motion of your joints, you become like a lot more likely to you know, get conditions like arthritis and pain. And this is the uh, con somewhat of the idea of like these CrossFit or these dynamic motion type of workouts and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think CrossFit to some degree, its success is like the popularization of what endurance athletes have known for a century, which is getting people to do intervals, like getting yeah. them interested in doing high intensity intervals. But yeah, I think this movement diversity is really important. And I think you can, Kelly's going to have another book coming out about this, but I think you can work this into your day without being too crazy. Like just change the normal motions you use for doing normal things when you can. And yeah, dance, definitely dance is, is great. Lots of range of motion. 
Now, we we talked about quitting before, and and you seem to be an advocate for knowing when to quit and pursuing something else. Um, And uh, and and how do you like how do you know when to do that? Because there there's definitely these there's 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 definitely a compounding that happens when you don't quit. Um, but then there's also a benefit to quitting. So how, how can what's the heuristic to know when to do it and when not to? Yeah, I think that's a tough question. What I don't and I don't think there's a perfect answer. But I think people tend to be so bad at it that even being a little better at quitting at the right time becomes a a competitive advantage. And I should say, I just blurbed a book that's coming out by Annie Duke, uh, you know, the, the poker player yeah, and, and the scientist yeah. uh, called Quit. And the whole book is about like how trying to be like a little bit smarter at your, at your quitting. And so I highly recommend this. And some of the things she recommends are things like, you know, looking at the sunk cost fallacy, right? Like people will stay doing something that they wouldn't have done objectively before just because they've invested some time in it. So this is like how how con men work is they know to start asking for sort of small things first, because yep. once they get you giving something, they'll, they'll get you giving more. And so she it says, also could become part of your identity, right? So then it's totally. harder to quit as well. Totally. And she, she writes about this also is like trying to have like an identity that's broader than just that thing you're doing so that it's easier for you to, to quit and not say like, I'm nothing and nobody. So like having more stuff going on again, that like network of enterprise, but she also talks about like, And I think she quoted Kahneman on this, having people in your life who love you, but don't care at all about your feelings that you can like bounce ideas off. I don't know if those people kind of exist, but yeah, but they're hard to find those people. Yeah. yeah, I think Kahneman has like like, all your friends have Asperger's or something. Like, I think it's hard (laughs) to have those people. Um, But she also talks about, and Seth Godin has talked about this, like having certain criteria before you start that says like, this is a deal breaker or, or this is a benchmark that I need to look at and, and stick to right? Which is sort of ahead of time before you're sort of um, in the middle of that situation. And he also, she likened actually, you know, like the minimum viable a product idea as getting something out quickly so you can get some feedback and understand if you should quit that direction and turn. So sort of making these smaller experiments so that you can- Like if you're going to write a it. book, like first do a series of tweets, then do some blogs, then do a longer form article, and then, totally. then do the book kind of thing. Totally, totally, totally. So you can get some feedback and say, it doesn't mean like you're quitting, but it's, it's um, you know, pivoting. And also I remember one of the things that made an impression on me in the book was um, she talked about like thinking in expected value, basically, and saying, you know, like there was some woman she was working with who had like a good job, but, but really didn't like it. And something totally out of left field came up and she's like, should I take this? And she's kind of like, I don't think so. Cause we usually like sort of default to, to stability. Yeah. She, she mentions all this research in the book that shows that um, when, if you feel like you quit at the right time, you definitely quit too late basically. Um, and so this woman, she was trying to get her to think in expected value and saying like, okay, if you stick with what you have now, what's the probability that you'll be unhappy in a year? And the woman was like, oh, a hundred percent and decided to, to jump. Right. So, so trying to I think mean, if you think about it in life, like the things that we really don't quit are often the things that give us the most um, fulfillment, whether it's yeah. like, you, you know, well, first of all, it's hard to quit being a parent um, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and, or, or even marriage, right. If marriage, marriage can be tough sometimes, but we don't, you know, if we don't quit it and we put it, it actually has a lot of value and fulfillment to us. Like, how do we, how do you square those two? Yeah. And I think, I also think an underlying point to what you're getting at is I think when people only focus on happiness, which I just mentioned as a dependent variable, like, I think there are other things that matter. Yeah. Um, Russ Roberts, I also wrote a book, I think coming out soon by Russ Roberts about this, that like meaning is important. And a lot of things, like some of the most meaningful projects to me in my life were, you know, running the 800 meters when I was a competitive runner and writing a book. And those things were like torture in the middle. I mean, nobody's like in the middle of the 800. Like I love doing this, you know, <laughs> but it's a very compelling thing to do, yeah. to be involved with. And, and I think like, I think something that I take to heart and that encompasses some of the habits of mind that Annie talks about is what's called self-regulatory learning, which is basically means like thinking about your own thinking and having a system for that, where when you do something, having a system to reflect back on it. Like when I was trying to write a first book, one of the scientists who studies this gave me a series of questions to ask myself every month and journal about, which was, what am I trying to do? 
why am I trying to do it? Am I sure I want to do it? What do I need to learn to be able to do it? Who do I need to um, help me in order to learn those things? What met and didn't meet my expectations? And you know, what did I learn about my strengths and weaknesses? And at first I was like, I'll answer these the same every month. And I never answered them the same twice. Hmm, interesting. It, it, it turns out that there's this literature showing that we actually should give people time even at work, even if it's a little for reflection, because we don't learn as much about our abilities and interests and where we should pivot if we don't actually do systematic reflection. And the people that do it end up finding their way to their own talents. And I think talent matching is extremely important. Um, and, and this will get, well, I'll get to this point later because I know you're going to ask me, but um, so I think having a, having a habit like that, some people just do it intuitively, but, but most people don't can really help you make lots of small updates with whatever you're involved in. It doesn't mean like get out of my marriage now, but like the research on marriage counseling shows that when, when couples go to counseling, it's usually six years after they should have started going six years after. So I think if you're doing this constant metacognition, you can make small updates, which by the way, is like the, one of the hallmarks of the super forecasters. They make many frequent small updates, whereas the poor forecasters make a small number of like giant ones. Yep. Yep. They're so, penduluming really big, right? Yeah. And so I think having that systematic practice of reflection um, can sort of help you in these taking these like small steps in a smart way and, and opportunistic pivots that don't feel like unmanageable. Now back to the medical side, I know you're you're you, you've had a uh, you have some strong opinions of around medical testing and getting tested for things. And you know, I'm someone who's certainly gotten lots of different genetic tests for cancer screening and full body scan to, and all this other stuff. But but I think you often give the advice: this is a bad idea. Why is it a bad idea? Yeah, this is why I thought that um, this sounds stupid, but that I thought Theranos would have been worse if it actually had worked. Um, because we probably would have massively exacerbated our epidemic of overtesting, where we have a huge amount of, of treatment right now that's low value. And some of the places, and a, a great book, by the way, to read about some of this called Ending Medical Reversal by Vinay Prasad, the hematologist, oncologist I mentioned, and Adam Sifu, a, a, a general medicine doctor. Um, and in, take something like, like prostate screening, for example, the reason that the recommendations in recent years and breast cancer screening have went from like everyone getting it early to saying like, actually wait until you're a little older is because it picks up a bunch of cases that will never harm anyone. And so you get this, you screen like a huge population. And when you zoom out and look at those populations, you get like a small decrease of a screened population in death from prostate cancer but no decrease in overall mortality and sometimes even an increase. Because they're getting death from being in the hospital and getting treated for random things and stuff. Presumably, something. Yep. And, and so- And stress and- When we actually, and not to mention like that, you know, having your prostate removed unnecessarily has all kinds of other implications, but um, when you zoom out and look at the bigger picture of um, does this get the ultimate outcome that we care about, it, it often doesn't. And so I think there are a couple of problems one, the screening is, is so, but, and even worse, to make it even more like difficult to grapple with and counterintuitive, survival rates of prostate cancer look like they get better when you screen a big population. But really what you're doing is detecting many more cases that nobody would ever think about unless they live to like 130. So it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. And so you get this artificial kind of benefit. And I think the, the problem- so like juices the stats essentially. Yeah. And the, the problems are you're picking up a lot of things, you know, you might save one, someone from certain things, but overall, you, you just don't see, you just empirically don't see that benefit. And I think a lot of screening also is based on so-called surrogate markers, which is you're, you're testing for a proxy of the thing you actually care about. And you right, are like elevated X in your blood or something like that. L let's take blood pressure. Like the, there was like basically a Nobel prize awarded for the discovery that led to like a blood pressure drug called atenolol, which is still like one of the most common blood pressure drugs prescribed in the United States. And atenolol was shown to be really good at lowering people's blood pressure. But what you actually care about is, are you decreasing people's risk of dying from heart attack well, heart or stroke? Attacks. Yeah. And it turned out that it didn't, they just died at the same rates with lower blood pressure numbers. Now there are other drugs that lower blood pressure and get that benefit. But it's kind of this example of we've assumed that these surrogate markers mm -hmm. are um, proxies for what we care about, and they often aren't. And this is actually where I think sometimes when I've had interactions talking about this stuff with like really 
smart tech people who are like, you know, interested in this stuff that, that their intuition can lead them a little bit astray because they're doing like glucose monitoring and all these other things, which might be good, but, but not always the right thing. And I think like they've built stuff, right? They've built stuff that works and view the human body as something similar where like we didn't design the human body. There's a ton of stuff that's still unscrutable to us. Some stuff isn't perfectly designed. And, and we just like do things that are so-called bio plausible that turn out to make all the sense in the world, but yet don't work when you actually like <laughs> zoom out and look at it empirically. And that's a really hard thing to like internalize. All right, a couple of questions about your pers personal questions. Um, I you were a super competitive runner um, at Columbia, and um, and I'm sure that kind of gave you an edge in sports journalism. But what is something that most sports writers get wrong about their coverage? I think I had I had this saying in my first book, The Sports Gene. I I open the book. The first chapter is about why Major League Baseball hitters can't hit softball pitchers. Like this woman named Jenny Finch had a TV show where she would go around and strike them out. And it's, and I was confused by this. I'm like, if they have reflexes fast enough to hit 100 mile per hour fastball, why can't they hit a 60 mile per hour softball? It, yeah. it coming from about 17 feet closer, but the transit time is even longer because the ball's so much slower. And it turns out that they don't have faster reflexes than normal. It's actually that they've learned through practice to pick up on like body signatures, like the rotation of a torso and the angle of a forearm. And they group it into what's called a chunk a signal that says like balls going here or there in the future, swing or don't swing as soon as the ball is released and the flicker of the pitch, which is the flashing pattern, the seams of the ball make. And when they're faced with an underhand pitcher who's their torso movements and shoulder rotation is totally different. They're stripped of this learned perceptual skills that allow them to predict the future, hmm. but they don't understand that. So sports writers often go and they'll ask athletes how they did what they did. And the athlete will give an explanation and they are, poorly positioned for most things to explain how they did it because it has to be totally automated in their brain and yeah. they have they have no idea and so like in quarterbacks sometimes you ask them what they're looking at and they'll say this and this and this but then if you look at if you put eye tracking glasses on them and see it's not what they say they'll say like i was looking at this guy or whatever the tracking glasses show that expert quarterbacks actually look at spaces between players that help them get like a sense of what's going to develop in the future and so I had this saying for sports writing that I tried to impress on, on some of my colleagues that just because you're a bird doesn't mean you're an ornithologist, that just because these people can fly doesn't mean that they're going to be able to give you the explanation for what they did. It doesn't mean that there's not good things to take from them. Yeah. But if you want to understand like the perceptual skills, they are very, very poorly positioned to tell you, which sometimes why like- Well, they often can't explain to other people. They can't teach other people. Often the very best players yeah. really are terrible coaches. Yeah, um, they, yeah. they, and so if you want to take, like, I, I don't, I, I don't know, I'd probably not benefit from a tennis lesson with Roger Federer. It'd be fun. Um, <laughs> but, but I'd rather just have just like the local pro probably give me a tennis lesson. You'd benefit from the, the selfies socially, but exactly. uh, maybe not yeah. tennis, but yeah, no, I mean, I think this, and this goes beyond sports, by the way, there was a guy named Hyman Bass who won the national science medal for, he developed K theory and algebra, you know, he's a great mathematician and did this research where he gave, um, like world-class mathematicians and like really good math teachers, a problem that kids had gone wrong on, like it was like mm -hmm. 49 times five or something and asked like, where did these kids go wrong? And the, the mathematicians really kind of couldn't figure it out. Whereas the best teachers were able to sort of reverse engineer like, oh, it's because they think this about the order of operations and it's wrong, this common misconception. And so- and is this just is like, is there just a specialized thing? Like I'm sure that, you know, Richard Feynman was a great, physics teacher or something. But when I had, when I, when I took physics in college, I, I took it from a few Nobel laureates and the Nobel, no, the, the Nobel laureates were by far terrible at teaching. Yeah. Um, but just like maybe the average TA was actually pretty good. Yeah. It, it's a different thing. And I think for those Nobel laureates, right. It's like when Michael Jordan tried drafted and tried to coach Kwame Brown, it's like, he is the person farthest in the world from understanding how those basic skills develop now, right. right? That's all totally automated in his brain from so, so long ago. And I think teaching is a different thing, not to say they can't learn to do it, but like in Hyman Bass's work, it was confusing to the mathematicians why they weren't as good at the teachers who they were obviously way, way better at math then. Yeah, interesting. All right, last question we ask all of our guests, what conventional wisdom or advice is generally bad advice? Um, I think this is going to sound terrible, but I think the advice you can be anything you want is generally bad advice. I think 
I think to the extent it means that you can be the person that you want to be personally, I think that's nice. But I think there's evidence that finding through experience what your talents are and matching to those is so important for your performance, your feeling of like resisting burnout, that that we should be more about like orienting people toward a trial and error experience of finding out where you fit and like what you're good at. And isn't that kind of like what the work world is? Like you, you have a bunch of different jobs and you're getting, you know, uh, uh, kudos in one versus the other and you do more of that or something to some degree. Although I think sometimes actually that can hold people back from some things if they get too much kudos and then they just stick and do that, that only one thing. Um, like I noticed, I started at sports illustrated as a temp fact checker and noticed like if you do really well at fact checking, you're probably going to get stuck there. So like <laughs> the people who move on are the ones who start like shirking the thing they're supposed to be doing. Basically. Um, and uh, that was, that was me and Pablo Torre, who's now like a star at ESPN. But so, so I think it's, I think it's a good expression to tell people like they shouldn't feel limited, but I also think it's really important to, to try to calibrate sensitively to what your talents are because talent is a very real thing and it's, and it's an important thing to match with. Okay. This has been awesome. All right. David Epstein, I follow you on Twitter at David Epstein. Is that the best place for our audience to engage with you? I have a free newsletter now at davidepstein.bulletin.com where sometimes I just write about random things, but sometimes I criticize either poor research or poor science journalism. Um, so, okay. I'm yeah. definitely going to subscribe to that as well. That sounds really cool. Uh, yeah. Great. To, this has been really great. Thank you so much for joining us at World of Das. It's a pleasure, Orin. I really enjoyed talking to you.